Baik. Baik, kalau begitu kita mulai saja acara pada sore hari ini. Sekali lagi saya ucapkan selamat sore kepada Bapak-Ibu hadirin sekalian yang saya hormati. Selamat datang di seminar pengenalan future dan foresight. Saya Vita Sari Anggreni dari Pulse Lab Jakarta. Saya akan memandu jalannya seminar pada sore hari ini. Mungkin sedikit perkenalan, Puslab Jakarta dengan Pusdatin Rembang dan Direktorat Pengembangan Koperasi dan UKM Bapenas bekerja sama dalam kemitraan analitika untuk memperkuat usaha mikro, kecil, dan menengah dalam konteks pertumbuhan inklusif dan pembangunan berkelanjutan. Nah, sebelum memulai acara, saya akan membacakan beberapa hal yang perlu diperhatikan bersama untuk kelancaran seminar ini. Yang pertama, mohon kerjasama Bapak-Ibu sekalian untuk mute mikrofon apabila tidak sedang berbicara. Kemudian untuk pertanyaan di sesi tanya-jawab nanti, silakan bisa tulis di kolom chat, atau nanti bisa tulis di slido yang link-nya akan kami bagikan, dan langsung atau bisa juga langsung menyalakan mikrofonnya. Yang terakhir, kami juga menyediakan layanan penerjemah untuk Bapak-Ibu sekalian, jadi silakan klik di tombol kanan bawah layar Zoom untuk dapat memilih bahasa karena sesi sore ini akan dilangsungkan dengan dua bahasa, bahasa Indonesia dan bahasa Inggris. Baik, pertama-tama saya juga ingin mengucapkan selamat datang kepada Bapak Ahmad Dading Gunadi, selaku Direktur Direktur Pengembangan Usaha Kecil, Menengah, dan Koperasi Bapenas. Terima kasih atas waktunya, Pak Dading. Kemudian Bapak Petra Cakareci, selaku Kepala Kantor Puslep Jakarta. Selamat datang juga kepada Bapak Ibu Perwakilan Direktorat di Bapenas dan Kementerian Koperasi dan UKM. Dan juga selamat datang kepada uh, Divat Australia, perwakilan dari Divat Australia yang telah hadir pada sore hari ini. Uh, dan juga selamat datang kepada narasumber utama kita hari ini, yaitu Tina Nuvonen, selaku Vocal Group Lead Strategic Foresight dari Pulse Lab Finlandia, dan Minke Minders dari, Strategic Forse, uh, dari Pulse Lab Finland, selaku Strategic Foresight Specialist. Baik, mungkin langsung saja untuk memulai acara ini Pak Petra untuk menyampaikan sambutannya. Mungkin untuk pertama-tama saya akan berikan waktu dan kesempatan kepada Bapak Ahmad Dading Gunadi. Kepada Pak Dading, saya persilahkan Pak. Baik, Ibu Vita yang saya hormati. Suara saya jelas ya, Bu Vita ya? Jelas Pak, terdengar. Baik, terima kasih atas kesempatannya. Yang saya hormati Pak Petra, kemudian ya resource person from Finland ya Ibu Tina Nevonen, and also Ibu Minke Meijden ya dari Finland juga ya from Finland. Thank you very much for joining in the seminar and sharing your expertise ya in foresight, uh, strategic foresight, uh, and ya, yeah, talk about ya, yeah, talk about uh, strategic uh, foresight. Uh, dan Bapak-Ibu yang saya hormati dari Kementerian Koperasi UKM dan juga dari Bapenas, selamat siang. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Jadi tadi disampaikan Ibu Vita, ini adalah proses kerjasama yang sudah kita laksanakan sejak tahun 2021 ya antara kami Bapenas khususnya Direktorat Pengembangan Koperasi UKM dan Pusdatin dengan Puslab Jakarta di dalam meningkatkan kualitas perencanaan pengembangan UMKM dan juga secara keseluruhan. Jadi ini sebenarnya bisa juga digunakan karena metodologi mengenai foresight eh, A future and foresight ini juga bisa digunakan untuk hal yang lain. Jadi menurut saya bisa juga untuk sektor-sektor yang lainnya. Jadi kita harapkan keluaran dari kerjasama ini adalah nanti terwujudnya dashboard visualisasi pemetaan ekosistem UMKM dan penggunaan metodologi future and foresight untuk mengantisipasi dinamika tren UMKM dalam 5 sampai 20 tahun ke depan. Kita akan selalu dihadapkan kepada proses perencanaan. Minimal kita harus sudah berpikir 5 tahun ke depan. Malah kita sudah akan menyusun 20 tahun ke depan ini sebentar lagi. Tahun ini kita sudah harus mengkaji mengenai background studi untuk 
pembangunan jangka menengah untuk jangka panjang untuk 20 tahun ke depan. Jadi sambil kita menyusun nanti pembangunan jangka menengah, kita juga menyusun untuk pembangunan jangka panjang. Jadi eh, hari ini sangat berguna sekali untuk kita semua sebagai bekal nanti melengkapi lah melengkapi bahan-bahan eh, untuk mendukung perencanaan ke depan. Jadi future and foresight ini adalah juga metode kualitatif ya bertujuan untuk mengidentifikasi sinyal-sinyal perubahan yang mungkin terjadi di masa depan. Jadi kita nah, memproyeksi ya, bukan meramal ini beda kalau ini lebih ke memproyeksi karena akan bicara dengan data kemudian dengan isu-isu yang ada kemudian juga dengan para pakar ya. Ini sangat baik sekali untuk menggabungkan berbagai masukan bagaimana kita merencanakan ke depan. Ya. Kemudian juga peran kami tentunya di Direktorat Pengembangan UKM dan Koperasi adalah sebagai mitra utamanya tapi kami sebutkan. Jadi nanti kita juga mungkin akan melakukan berbagai proses penguatan di bidang yang lainnya terkait dengan pendataan ini. Nah, ini akan kita lakukan sampai eh, ke depan ya. Mungkin sam sampai tahun ini apa tahun depan ya, Bu Pak Petra ya? Tahun ini. Tahun ini, Pak. Tahun tahun ini. Ini. <laughs> Sayang sekali tahun ini kita sudah selesai. Terasa tidak eh, tidak lama ini ya. Jadi mudah-mudahan sih dalam waktu yang singkat kita bisa mendapatkan berbagai informasi tadi tidak hanya keluaran atau output yang dihasilkan tetapi knowledge yang penting knowledge yang akan kita dapatkan dan kita akan teruskan ya teruskan untuk merencanakan uh, ke depan dan harapan kami uh, tentu mudah-mudahan dari hasil seminar ini kita mendapatkan bekal yang cukup kuat begitu ya yang sangat kuat nanti kita dalam proses perencanaan dan nanti jadi tentunya jangan hanya bekal ini adalah untuk knowledge kita sendiri, kita akan coba aplikasikan di dalam proses perencanaannya. Ya. Jadi ini betul-betul harus kita buktikan bahwa ini bisa digunakan di dalam proses perencanaan. Tentu nanti kita bersama-sama pada kesempatan ini kita sudah hadir, kemudian nanti suatu saat kita bisa berkumpul lagi untuk melakukan proses perencanaan yang sebenarnya di dalam perencanaan ke depan dan khususnya juga untuk kooperasi dan UMKM. Demikian yang bisa saya sampaikan, tentu juga saya akan mengikuti seminar ini, jadi kepada teman-teman juga selamat mengikuti, dan saya juga ingin mendapatkan pengetahuan mengenai future and foresight ini. Baik, terima kasih, dan sekali lagi selamat mengikuti, dan terima kasih kepada para narasumber yang akan berbicara pada hari ini. Saya kembalikan ke Ibu Pita. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat siang. Selamat sore ya. Baik. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Pak Dading atas sambutannya dan juga terima kasih atas uh, dukungannya selama ini, baik di sisi yang strategis maupun di uh, working level ya Pak ya. Baik, mungkin langsung saja saya akan serahkan waktu dan kesempatan kepada Pak Petra untuk memberikan sambutan. Silakan Pak Petra. Terima kasih banyak Pak Fita. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat sore, salam sehat dan sejahtera untuk kita semua. Pak Dading yang saya hormati dan beserta tim PUKMK yang sudah luar biasa berkolaborasi dalam kegiatan ini sejauh uh, uh, sampai dengan uh, saat ini dan juga tim dari Kementerian Koperasi yang uh, dan UMKM yang saya hormati dan tidak lupa tentunya tim Pusdatin Renbang yang selalu mengiring semua langkah uh, Polsek Jakarta dalam kolaborasi dengan berbagai mitra uh, pemerintah Indonesia uh, yang saya hormati pula teman-teman uh, dari Finlandia uh, uh, Ibu Tina, Ibu Mingke, uh, Ibu Mario Uh, Ibu Kodia yang uh, apa, uh, turut mendukung pelaksanaan dari uh, uh, kegiatan pada hari ini dan uh, tentunya ke depan uh, uh, ada kat, uh, uh, tidak ada yang kebetulan ya Pak, Pak Dading uh, bahwa uh, tapi uh, yang menarik ini pas 10 tahun Polsek Jakarta tahun ini Pak 
dan uh, saya pikir ini uh, luar biasa bahwa ini ada momentum baru. Memang tadi Pak Dari bilang uh, sayang juga kalau uh, cuma berhenti di tahun uh, ini karena mungkin masih tanggung dan proses sampai dengan penyusunan RPJMN masih ber, ber, berjalan. Jadi saya pikir mungkin ini juga bagian dari proses transisi dan evolusi Postlab Jakarta sebagai bagian dari jejaring atau jaringan Global Pulse, uh, UN Global Pulse, dengan adanya uh, juga uh, uh, apa, uh, 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 komponen-komponen baru di dalam jaringan ini, termasuk UN Global Pulse Finland. Jadi uh, terus terang kami sangat berterima kasih kepada Pak Dading dan tim juga ke Pusdatin dan Bank yang memungkinkan uh, adanya sebuah, sebuah kegiatan yang sangat signifikan yang memungkinkan juga atau mendorong kolaborasi seperti ini uh, dengan uh, pemanfaatan future foresight yang terus terang ini menjadi salah satu uh, peluang pertama yang uh, di dalam jaringan Global Pulse untuk betul-betul mulai menerapkan future foresight bersama dengan mitra pemerintah pada Ding. Jadi Uh, dan uh, Bapak Ibu, jadi terima kasih banyak atas kesempatan ini sebenarnya dan semoga justru ini sebagai cikal bakal kita bisa melihat uh, apa uh, skala dan konsekuensi dari apa yang kami kerjakan pada tahun ini dengan UKM dan uh, UMKM sehingga uh, kita bisa berbicara uh, tidak saja mengenai Uh, apa uh, kegiatan kita tahun ini, tetapi mulai melihat uh, ke depan uh, bereks, uh, untuk mengekspansi dan melanjutkan apa yang uh, selama ini uh, sebenarnya dijalankan dengan uh, sorry ini ada uh, ada slide yang menampilkan bahwa bukan saja Pulse Lab Jakarta, tetapi Global Pulse da, sejak 2008 itu sebenarnya berawal dari sebuah pembicaraan antara Presiden Indonesia pada saat itu Pak uh, uh, Susu Bambang Yudhoyono dengan uh, Sekjen PBB Bang Kimun uh, pada saat itu yang menjadi cikal bakal berbicara mengenai Global Pulse yang sekarang uh, berwujud pada 10 tahun juga uh, ulang tahunnya Pulse Lab Jakarta. Jadi uh, saya pikir uh, ini sangat uh, penting. Kalau boleh satu poin saja Mbak Vita adalah uh, uh, yang selalu kita tekankan adalah dibalik kegiatan ini dengan uh, apa uh, mengenai UMKM adalah uh, manusianya ya ada kalau kita bilang let's say 25 juta UMKM katakanlah ada 5 5 orang rata-rata per UMKM yang bekerja di masing-masing UMKM ini kan berarti 125 uh, juta manusia uh, yang yang masa depannya akan berpengaruh dengan kebijakan-kebijakan yang dikembangkan dari sini belum lagi uh, ekornya ya Pak apa uh, dependen uh, para keluarga anggota keluarga dan sebagainya jadi sekali lagi menurut saya ini sesuatu yang sangat signifikan sangat penting menjadi kehormatan uh, bagi kami untuk boleh mendukung proses dan uh, proses ini melalui uh, future for side stream uh, terima kasih sekali lagi dan saya serahkan kembali wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Pak Petra atas sambutannya dan uh, pesan-pesannya untuk uh, kita ke depannya. Baik, uh, terima kasih uh, atas sambutannya juga Bapak, Pak Dading dan Pak Petra. Mungkin uh, sebelum kita masuk ke acara yang uh, inti, uh, saya ingin sedikit memberi pertanyaan hiburan nih kepada Bapak Ibu sekalian ya. Uh, mungkin ada beberapa yang apa sih yang dimaksud dengan feature and foresight gitu ya terus uh, apa sih kira-kira yang akan disampaikan di acara ini tapi sebelumnya uh, mungkin uh, saya ingin kita uh, bapak ibu sekalian join di slido.com uh, bisa uh, scan barcode di layar ini atau masuk ke slido.com dan masukkan angka 495 474 oke okay. uh, mungkin sudah bisa langsung saya ini ya Mbak Desi ya masuk ke pertanyaan pertama ya oke nah untuk pertanyaan pertama apa hal pertama yang muncul dalam pikiran Bapak Ibu ketika mendengar istilah future and foresight jadi tidak perlu ragu-ragu Uh, tulis saja kira-kira apa sih yang pertama kali muncul di kepala ketika mendengar istilah future and foresight. Mungkin yang berkaitan dengan sesuatu yang kreatif juga boleh atau yang didengar di luar uh, dunia perencanaan gitu juga boleh. 
Oke, okay. menarik ya di sini. Jadi memahami apa yang akan terjadi, okay. anticipation, okay. planning, prediksi. Ada science fiction, menarik ini. Ada science fiction. Um, ya, yeah. digital data, artificial intelligence. Heuristic planning, menarik ini. Design features, AI. Oke, okay. baik. Terima kasih. Uh, terima kasih atas partisipasinya. Mungkin kita langsung masuk ke pertanyaan kedua ya, uh, Desi ya. Oke, okay, menurut Bapak-Ibu, tren apa yang akan muncul 10 tahun ke depan? Silahkan, bisa sekreatif mungkin. Apakah mungkin um, K-pop gitu ya, <laughs> kalau saya boleh nulis. Apapun itu, silakan. Uh, jangan jangan ragu-ragu, jangan khawatir. Nah ini kebetulan uh, banyak yang pakai bahasa Inggris, jadi mungkin uh, Tina dan Mingke Mari juga bisa langsung paham ya. Untuk tren yang muncul 10 tahun ke depan paling besar uh, AI, climate change tentunya, kemudian metaverse banyak juga ya yang memasukkan metaverse di sini. Korean Wave, menarik nih. Ada mobil terbang juga. <laughs> Jakarta Tenggelam. Oke. Okay. NFT ya, NFT tentunya akan menjadi tren ya 10 tahun ke depan. Oke, okay, saya melihat antusiasme Bapak Ibu sekalian dalam menjawab pertanyaan yang saat ini. Increase women leadership. Betul sekali teleporting. Smart city. Oke. Okay. <laughs> Oke, okay, uh, terima kasih antusiasmenya. Uh, mungkin uh, terakhir satu pertanyaan lagi. Menurut Bapak-Ibu, tantangan besar atau ancaman apa sih yang mungkin muncul 10 tahun ke depan? Uh, misalnya ya virus ya seperti COVID sekarang atau apapun. Kira-kira uh, tantangan terbesar itu apa sih dalam waktu 10 tahun ke depan? Silahkan. Baik, uh, saya ingin menyambut Pak Irfan yang hadir di sini juga. Uh, mungkin setelah ini Pak Irfan uh, akan memberi sambutan ya Pak. Sekarang kita sedang uh, ada pertanyaan hiburan untuk hadirin sekalian. Oke, okay. climate change paling besar ya, yang paling menantang. Kemudian SDM dan teknologi, climate crisis, wars. Oke, okay. nah uh, baik. Terima kasih atas partisipasinya dan jawaban-jawabannya. Kira-kira ini apa sih nanti hubungannya ya dengan apa yang akan kita uh, dengarkan dalam waktu satu jam ke depan? Metode-metode um, uh, apa yang mungkin bisa uh, berhubungan dengan apa yang uh, sedang kita bicarakan kali ini uh, akan menarik. Uh, namun uh, saya minta izin ke so uh, Tina and Minka before we go to your session. Uh, since Pak Irfan uh, is already here, uh, I would like to give the time for Pak Irfan to. Uh, convey his messages before we start, if that's okay with you. Selamat datang Pak Irfan. Uh, dan uh, sebelum kita mulai, jadi kita memang belum mulai acara intinya, Pak. Uh, uh, saya ingin memberikan kesempatan dulu kepada Pak Irfan untuk menyampaikan uh, sambutannya. Ya. Pada Pak Irfan, Terima saya persilahkan. Teman-teman semua, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yang terhormat Pak Dading, Pak Petra, Bapak Ibu, teman-teman, uh, Ibu Tina dan Ibu Mika dari UN Global Pulse Finland, welcome to our session here. I'm so sorry that I have been late for this uh, meeting because I should attend the meeting with my minister about the, the MOU signing with the uh, Ministry of Investment. And, uh, um, BKPM ya. Jadi pas sore ini kita sebagai salah satu upaya untuk memperkuat proses kita dalam kemampuan analitika data terkait dengan UMKM di Indonesia. Ini kita kerjasama dengan Pak Dading dan teman-teman dari Pulse Lab. Dan hari ini kita sangat bergembira karena ada teman-teman dari UN Global Pulse di Finland yang bisa ikut berkontribusi memberikan masukan dan memberikan insight yang lebih luas gitu kepada kita. Jadi hari ini kita mudah-mudahan dapat banyak eh, 
berdiskusi dan saling sharing knowledge dan memperoleh uh, inspirasi lebih lanjut gitu ya dari hal-hal yang sudah kita laksanakan sebenarnya pada saat sejak tahun lalu dan uh, pada sore ini kami juga menyambut uh, teman-teman dari Kementerian KPM uh, untuk bisa bergabung dengan kita menggunakan nanti proses ini yang melibatkan bukan hanya technical matters of uh, analytical data analytics gitu ya, tapi kita lebih ke uh, gimana substansi dan uh, pencapaian tujuan pembangunan di uh, usaha mikro, kecil dan menengah ini bisa uh, semakin kuat gitu dengan kemampuan analisis yang kita juga uh, bangun sama-sama dan kita saling memperkuat dan mudah-mudahan ini menjadi program yang di Pulse Lab Jakarta sendiri akan terus uh, menjadi sebuah uh, kegiatan unggulan dan terutama kita juga di Kementerian PPN Bapak Nas. Jadi ini kita uh, mudah-mudahan dengan feature foresight yang tadi sudah ada game yang di pandu Bu Vita, kita bisa dapat uh, mendapatkan inspirasi awal gitu ya seperti apa kira-kira tren pengelolaan UMKM ke depan dan ini juga bisa menjadi landasan kita untuk menyusun kebijakan dan perencanaan lebih lanjut gitu. Jadi hari ini proses diskusinya mudah-mudahan bisa kita laksanakan dengan baik. Ini saya sekali lagi mohon maaf karena ada delay karena saya sendiri harus tadi secara fisik harus hadir gitu. Sehingga sambutan ini saya agak terlambat. Dan untuk itu saya juga terima kasih untuk semua panitia untuk pelaksanaan kegiatannya. Kita lanjutkan saja langsung di diskusi dan penjelasan lebih lanjut dari teman-teman semua. Terima kasih mungkin itu dari saya. Saya kembalikan ke kita. Baik, terima kasih. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Terima kasih Pak Irfan sambutannya. Pesan-pesannya sangat penting untuk di apa ya untuk acara kali ini dan bagaimana kemudian apa yang disampaikan hari ini bisa digunakan untuk pembuatan kebijakan. Menurut saya itu pesan yang sangat penting sekali. Baik, untuk sesi selanjutnya saya akan langsung saja, saya mohon izin untuk menggunakan bahasa Inggris, untuk Bapak-Ibu bisa menggunakan interpreter di menu interpreter di kanan bawah. Oke, okay, uh, for the next session, I'd like to introduce our resource person today, as uh, I have introduced uh, at the beginning. So we have Tina Nubonen as the uh, focal group lead for strategic foresight from PostLab Finland. Tina is a sociologist and innovation professional combining an understanding of people, technology, and foresight. Formerly, she worked on innovation initiatives at UNESCO New York and in East Africa overseeing the organization's ICT innovation portfolio with focus on rural empowerment. We also have a Minka Miners here as our strategic foresight specialist from PostLab Finland. Minka holds a master's degree in international relations and affairs. She has several years of experience designing various strategic foresight projects and experiments within a government context, within a think bank for international relations and within academia. So without further ado, I would uh, hand over this opportunity to Tina and Minka. Over to you, Tina. Thank you so much, Vita. Um, our distinguished uh, uh, participants from the government of Indonesia, Mr. Daring, Ms. Um, our colleagues from the Pulse Lab Jakarta. It is absolute honor and pleasure to be here today. So I thank you on behalf of the whole team for opening this space for us to, to participate uh, and work with you on this shared innovation journey. I have to say that we are really, really impressed by your openness to, to innovation and trying new things for the benefit of the, the people of Indonesia. And I'm very, very excited to kick off with this collaboration. So thank you again for being here with us uh, today. I've been asked to give a, a small presentation about the what and why and how of Foresight. Um, it's going to be a little taster. Of course, there's much, much more to cover, but I hope that uh, there's some things and some inspiration that you could take away from, from this uh, presentation before I hand over to, to my colleague Minke, who will then give a little bit detailed presentation about the horizon scanning uh, process and, and project that we are embarking together. 
So let's talk about, about the what, uh, what of foresight a little bit first. When we start doing futures on foresight, there's a fundamental shift in how we think about the future, the background. So the basic assumption here is that uh, there are many possible futures, not just one, but many, and we can influence them. And we definitely should influence them. So future is not just something that happens to us, but it's something that we are actively shaping. And to, in order to do that, we also need to build our future's capabilities. Here we can see the cone of futures, which is a classic example, uh, uh, kind of visualization of the uh, range of possible futures that we can see. And why um, this is very, um, very important for us is that um, this can help us to uh, visualize the diversity of different futures that might happen. And all of us, whether we were aware of that or not, we have a certain set of assumptions and expectations about the future, but this is often something that we don't think about explicitly. But why it's so important to understand our own images or the shared images and assumptions about the future is that our thinking of the future actually guides our action and, and thinking of today. So they are very much connected. And we have this tendency to short-term thinking. So with futures uh, and foresight, we can really broaden and expand the, the time horizon. And also if we are kind of um, embracing, let's say the negative futures or images of the future, then uh, we will be very focused on preparing and, and risk and, and kind of um, um, mitigating those risks that we foresee. But then again, like if you give more emphasis for the uh, aspired futures, uh, then we are doing actions already today that can accelerate, uh, accelerate the emergence of those uh, aspired futures. And this can really help us to step up, for instance, our innovation efforts and, and uh, um, prepare more forward looking policy as well. And this is something that Mr. Dadding already highlighted. So thank you for doing that. What foresight is not, it's, it's not about uh, predicting what will happen. Unfortunately, it's very unlikely that the future will become more predictable. On the contrary, it looks like it's becoming much more complex and, and unpredictable also in the short term frame. So we are not trying to predict the future, but rather uh, look at the whole range and diversity of the futures that might unfold and, and prepare ourselves for the negatives and the positives are likely uh, in a very proactive manner. So why do we need foresight now, perhaps more than ever before? Um, the reasons is that, as we all know, the rate of the change in the world is accelerating exponentially. And because of that, our current practices, our current policies and ways of understanding the world working are becoming obsolete at an exponential rate. So there is this growing relevance gap uh, that is only increasing as the complexity and, and change or rate of change accelerate. And this relevance gap is already very clearly visible in our organizations. We know that it's hard to match the complexity of challenges that we are trying to solve. We know that the short-term course corrections are not enough anymore to solve the problems that we are tackling. And we also know that people have this tendency to crowd thinking and herd thinking. So we are, it's really difficult to uh, develop disruptive new ideas that would kind of uh, diverge from the mainstream, mainstream opinions. And we also have bias towards the short-term action and reactive action. So we have to really stretch our thinking to switch to that long-term mode. And this is indeed why we need think more foresight, more futures thinking, which is something that the Secretary General of the United Nations also uh, endorses, um, also as a part of the, the our, um, our common agenda. So foresight can really be a tool to shift away from the business as usual approaches and uh, also make sure that we are moving towards the breakthrough scenario, toward a greener, safer, better future, and not 
towards the breakdown scenario of the virtual crisis uh, characterized by the pandemics, uh, unhabitable planet, and, and destabilizing inequalities and exacerbating inequalities. So foresight is really a tool to do this course change and elaborate how do we move towards the better futures and how do we avoid and prepare for the risks that we already see unfolding or uh, see the signals of this um, crisis emerging. And then maybe in the end, just a couple of words about how we can use foresight and how can we get into the mode of using foresight. In the UN context, the Secretary General has primarily recommended uh, use around four broad areas, um, especially around the new uh, social contract, which is anchored in human rights, about uh, working on the succeeding generations agenda and holding ourselves into account for the people who will inherit this planet from us. Um, the third area is the global public goods and about addressing together the major global risks and, and really stepping up the efforts and collaboration around that. And finally, the thought area is more about inward looking view. How do we transform as an organization? How do we change the United Nations to step up to these challenges that we are faced with? As a concrete example, we did a um, foresight exercise last autumn with the UN senior management group. And uh, the agenda was to look at the post and imagine the post uh, UN, post, uh, excuse me, post COVID-19 UN, what kind of organization we need to build. And for that exercise, we developed three scenarios. One was business as usual, basically what happens is if UN continues as it is, and then the positive and, and negative scenario. And these scenarios helped us to have a structured conversations about how well the UN's agenda, the current policies and approaches would hold uh, against different uh, future projections or future scenarios, which are kind of um, provocations of what might happen, not, not like uh, um, kind of Giving, a, um, giving an example, this is exactly what happens, but this is what might happen if the worst and, and kind of best cases are included in our considerations. There are also other forward-looking proposals in the common agenda and activities which are already in progress. There's eight altogether, but um, I just wanted to highlight two here uh, with which we are directly involved. Another one is the Global Risk Report, and another one is the UN Futures Lab. And these are the two activities that we will, we will be leading uh, uh, at the UN Global Pulse. I will also share the slides after you, so you can have a look at the other activities if you are interested. Um, and then maybe just a few words also about how governments are uh, approaching their own development of their own foresight uh, practices and ecosystems. Predominantly, there are two ways to set up the foresight model. There is centralized model or centralized approach, and then the decentralized model. And these model, models have their own uh, processes, processes for uh, integrating foresight into decision-making and, and policy-making mechanism. Um, in the centralized model, we see the engagement through the head of office of governments and uh, wisdom setting by central bodies and development of foresight tools and knowledge transfer uh, in the organization. The decentralized model is often more inclusive, um, often uh, includes the government, private sector and civil society bodies as well. And uh, the activities are focused around consensus building and uh, developing collaborative uh, experiments and approaches through communities of practice. This is again like very, very busy slide, which I, I'm happy to share with you to provide some more examples about how uh, member states and organizations are developing their own foresight practice. But I just wanted to pull out one example from Finland, um, which is um, uh, taking the decentralized uh, approach to foresight and 
They are preparing annually this government report on the future, uh, which will be uh, reviewed by different government uh, departments. And what is really special about this uh, report is that we are not just consulting, or the government is not just consulting the uh, usual suspects or experts, but it's very participatory, it's very inclusive, um, and includes consultations with marginalized. Uh, and disadvantaged groups, uh, including immigrants, disabled people, uh, prostitutes, uh, drug abusers, so really those who, um, who usually are not heard and included in the uh, future agenda setting. And this is a one mechanism to kind of do the bottom-up uh, strategy and agenda setting in a government context. And finally, the best way really to do foresight is to provide people with the skills to do the foresight. Um, and that's why we are also very, very happy besides, of course, this uh, horizon scanning uh, initiative that we are kicking off to, to see some participation of webinars and Puzzle uh, of as well on this course, uh, Foresight for Systems Change, which we are uh, offering in collaboration with the uh, uh, School of International Futures and ITC ILO, which is the International Labour Organization's training arm. So very much looking forward to seeing you there. Uh, as well as working, uh, working and, and uh, collaborating and innovating and experimenting with you during this horizon scanning, uh, scanning we are kicking off today. Thank you so much again uh, for your participation and time, and I will now hand it back to Vita. Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Uh, I think it's really, really important uh, also to point out on the examples from various uh, countries, but also organization on how to use this approach. Uh, but before that, uh, before we move to further discussion, I would uh, hand it over to Minka, directly over to you, Minka. Give me one second. Uh, welcome, uh, all of you. And then and again, uh, echoing what already uh, colleagues have been saying, it's uh, super exciting uh, to to actually kick this off because we've been working on it for quite a while. And there's a lot of work in the, behind the scenes. Uh, but uh, I would like to thank the UN Global Post Jakarta, but also all the scanners who are going to participate uh, in, in uh, doing this uh, together with us. Um, so I would like to tell you a bit more about the Horizon Scan methodology, but then also a bit more about the Horizon Scan in specifically the context we are going to do it uh, uh, the coming months in, uh, in here for the MSMEs in Indonesia. So what is actually Horizon Scanning? Well, Tina already said uh, uh, what strategic foresight is. Was horizon Scanning is basically the foundation of any strategic foresight process. It is often found at the beginning of a forward-looking activity and part of a full process, uh, but it can also be a standalone activity, uh, just as we're going to carry it out um, uh, in this context. Uh, horizon scanning, in essence, is an evidence-gathering process to identify potential challenges and opportunities that could alter the future landscape. So we're looking for uh, new upcoming trends, we're looking for emerging issues, we're looking for weak signals uh, that could alter the, the future landscape. It's also important to underscore that it's a structured process. Uh, it may involve desk research, expert surveys, interviews and review of uh, existing futures literature. Why do we actually do horizon scanning? Well, the purpose of horizon scanning is to help us better understand the system and the factors that might shape it. So with this horizon scan, we really try to understand the system and the, the future landscape that might emerge uh, in which MSMEs have to operate in the coming uh, decade. By looking for signals that could potentially alter the future landscape, we aim to enhance future preparedness for decision-making. Um, it's meant as a as a way to to have this uh, continuous strategic dialogue around the the, the key emerging issues um, and have this have a speculation on what could potentially what what are these signals and what could they mean for for the for the future. 
Well, great foresight uh, actually starts always with horizon scanning. Uh, I think it's uh, important to understand that a lot of uh, different organizations do uh, do horizon scanning. So it's not only international organizations like the UN, but it's also the EU, the uh, various countries uh, doing it on a uh, regular basis. Uh, private sector is doing it and, and also uh, NGOs. Uh, I, lined out a few examples here of WHO, uh, WPC and Save the Children that all carry out an, an, their horizon scan. And you can see that it can either be very broad, so Save the Children is doing a very broad regional horizon scan, but it can also be very specific on a specific topic, uh, for example, that the WHO is carrying out on the um, public health. Um, the time horizon can differ. Uh, it can be either a bit, bit shorter term, medium term, long term. So it is a very dynamic um, method that we can alter for, for, the, for the specific purpose uh, we have to serve. So now let's maybe move on to the horizon scan in the context of the future of MSMEs. Um, I think it's uh, important to underscore like the the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has really showed that we need to prepare differently. The, this has disrupted not only the entire world, but also uh, specifically MSMEs in Indonesia. Uh, so we need to step it up. We need different methods. Uh, we can't continue as business as usual. So this is where strategic foresight and now specifically horizon scanning comes in. So the key question here is what potential developments could affect the future of MSMEs in the coming 20 years? We will have two different time horizons. We will focus for, for signals that uh, for the five to 10 years on medium term and on the longer term. Questions we're trying to answer like, what is this, what is the future landscape going to look like? What could potentially new developments be that could alter, alter this landscape? Um, and we will do this by using three main methods uh, in this study. Uh, one is a desk-based manual scan uh, of relevant sources. We will scan very broadly website, recent publications of institutes, organizations, specialized press, and validated social media feeds of relevant experts. I think here is already you can see that we are. It's not looking for the mainstream or only the traditional sources, but we aim to scan broadly. A second method is uh, we're going to conduct interviews with relevant experts and other stakeholders. We will first do a, a, a quick a stakeholder mapping, of course, to identify the, the key important ones. Uh, and then lastly, when we have done this uh, horizon scan, uh, we will have focal group discussions to actually validate the results, to reduce uh, biases in our future thinking and identify potentially blind spots. What haven't we thought about? even having done this, this scanning process really thoroughly, we probably will all have blind spots and hopefully by doing those focal group discussions, we might uncover some of it. Managing expectations is also important because there will always be blind spots and with strategic foresight, we try to uh, detect as much as possible, but uh, of course we're, we're, not, we're not in the, in the art of predicting, but uh, we, are, we are in the art of exploring as much as possible. Uh, to maybe roughly go through the process a bit, uh, the process will start with, uh, we have a scanner team uh, that's scanning 12 scanners, um, both from, from Bapanas, uh, UN Global Pulse Jakarta, and we as UN Global Pulse uh, Finland will, will uh, lead this methodology speaking. We will divide people in, in three groups, political and legal team, social and economic, and a tech and environment. Why do we do this? Because we want to have a, as much as a broad scope as possible for doing this scanning. We want to cover all these different relevant themes that we use as a lens through which we do, do the scanning. They are, as said, being trained and, and guided by foresight experts. We will kick off next week with a specialized training on this. Uh, we develop the manual uh, to guide this process. And we will have regular check-ins with the teams to guide them throughout this process. But, it's, but it is really something that we, we are not only going to do it ourselves as foresight experts, but we really want uh, this skill to be developed by, uh, 
by others and, and share how, how you can best do it so that so that people can do it themselves in the future. Um, sorry, I'm talking a lot about future also in my in my daily life. Um, then we will um, uh, compile with this granting group. We will compile a source list. I think uh, that's an important starting point of doing your horizon scan. We will identify the so-called hubs of forward thinking. That sounds fancy, but it's it's just a way to to think like where is the the, the most likely uh, future thinking being done. This is probably not being done in in academic uh, spheres. This is probably not being done in like the traditional research bodies of, of uh, governments. This is probably done in different places on social media, on uh, the, the non-mainstream sources, etc. So we will think through where can you actually look for, for these signals. We will do a quick stakeholder analysis for the interviews and we will, when we all have com combined, compiled this, to do a quick peer review with, uh, with peers to, to check is this source list a good starting point? Do we miss sources? Is it diverse enough, etc.? And this is to limit our biases because we're all very prone to, to having biases. Then the next step is uh, to scan and collect the information. We will do this manual scan. Uh, we will do the, conduct the interviews. And these signals that we will collect will be processed in a database. Uh, the scanners will fill in an, an online form where we will ask them to, for each signal, identify, for example, what is it, what is it actually what you find and what is, what could be potential future implications. And this is probably not something you will find in the signal, but you have to think through it a bit yourself. We will uh, ask scanners to give a bit of an idea of what is the likelihood of this, this uh, signal to fall out and how novel is it? Is it already on the radar of policymakers or, or should we maybe put this on the agenda? So for each of the signals, we will uh, yeah, guide that um, and have this um, collected in, in, the go in, sorry, in the database. Once we've uh, done with it, the next step is filtering the results. So with the scan teams will identify the most relevant signals from based on predefined and peer reviewed criteria. Uh, again, on novelty, impact, likelihood. And then as a result, we have some sort of short list of the important things we, we think that should be in the report, but also in the agenda and the things, of things that really should be taken into account uh, when, when uh, it further on in the policy and strategy making process. We will discuss this short list uh, of relevant signals with focal groups. Uh, we will engage with a wider group of people, policymakers, and other stakeholders to validate really the results uh, and discuss future implications. And then as an the output, hopefully uh, in the end of the summer, we have this report. We will also build together with you in Global Pulse, a uh, Jakarta the, and the mini side. Um, and we also will share the, the manual that we developed to also uh, give you some, some guidance or maybe instructions on how you can do scanning yourself to continue this process. But I think, uh, and Tina already underscored this really much, it starts, we have designed this beautiful process and you could be very rigorous in your method, but it starts with changing and shifting your mindset. You have to have an open mind and you have to dare to challenge your own assumptions. We are going to look for weak signals and that's not easy. It's not an easy task. Uh, it will challenge you to step outside your comfort zone and to, to maybe leave your, your, your ex area of expertise and your silo uh, so that you uh, yeah, really need to step it up and, and uh, Dare to, dare to challenge what you already, what you always thought is was true. It is not necessarily about predictions. So I think this has been underscored already by by the previous speakers as well. But we cannot under, underline it enough. It's about exploring the plausible futures, about the plausible ways that future futures might unfold. And also, a guiding principle here is that it's an iterative approach. We learn by doing and are open to feedback. There's no fixed way of doing horizon scanning. Uh, so we are always open to, to change when needed. Uh, of course, having, having this methodology, uh, methodological rigorousness in place, but the, the process itself can be very flexible and we uh, uh, invite you all to just share your, share your lessons so get, that you're also able to carry this forward um, uh, later on. 
Uh, as already said, the where are we going to look for? Well, the key is really to look widely. Uh, people have the tendency to, to defer back to their own bubble, to their own uh, um, the sources they always consult. But here we really need to, to, to broaden that and to diversify the sources we're going to look for. So we will look for unusual sources, uh, not only on the web, but also um, uh, we might look for TED Talks on YouTube, we do, we read blogs, we talk to people, we go and, and have conversations with community leaders, etc. So this is really to, to expand our horizon in that way. So what would do we actually mean with it? And, and maybe uh, we have two signal examples that, that to just give you an idea about the, 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 the um, signals we're looking for. For this example, for example, we looked at we found something on a mainstream uh, source, the website of the World Economic Forum, that says that reducing pl plastic waste at source is a, a key part of Indonesia battle against ocean pollution. And this is then what we hope uh, we could, could uh, that, that scanners would pick up, like, oh, this could be potentially interesting for MSMEs, uh, but why? Uh, the what is really like plastic waste is a massive threat to Indonesian marine, marine environment. Upstream innovation to reuse and reduce plastics are key to fighting plastic pollution and creating circular business opportunities in Indonesia. That's the what, that's what you will find in the article and that might spark the interest of the scanner. And then you have to think through one step further, like so what? This development could create potentially a window of opportunity to shift businesses into the circular agenda and effectively mitigate plastic pollution, utilizing green innovation as an engine for the future. Uh, this could, of course, create ample new business opportunities for MSMEs in Indonesia. Uh, but in the transition phase, when people have to, to transition towards this circular and green uh, economy, uh, we could also expect some disruption to, to conduct business, right? Um, so this is hopefully something the scanner will pick up, do a little analysis on it and, and put that in the database. Uh, we anticipate just as a rough first indication, it's going to be a long-term uh, effect. It will have an impact on environment and tech. It's probably not underappreciated. It's probably already a bit on the radar of policymakers, but it's very likely that this will happen and therefore uh, interesting to put forward in the database. And this will primarily uh, uh, create opportunities rather than it's a threat to Indonesian MSMEs. A second example that I wanted to share is a non-mainstream source. Uh, this is something we found on the website TechWire. That's probably a source that a lot of people don't usually consult, but it could still contain relevant information. For example, we found here that the meta study revealed that small businesses heading toward a hybrid future. Um, and this global trend of small businesses transitioning towards a hybrid business model that is being both digital and physical operations together could also take place in Indonesia. This is again the what, and we will ask scanners, but so what? What could, what are potentially, what is this pointed towards? Uh, what could, what could it mean on the long term for for MSMEs in Indonesia? But well, this trend can change the future of MSMEs where digital platforms and currencies may become key success drivers. It may not only impact how businesses are operating uh, and what products and services they will provide, but also where they will be operating. So overall, the signals also highlighting the need for digital literacy and improved access to digital economy. Again, this is hopefully something uh, that scanners might pick up and think through potential implications. Um, the process of collecting signals, it's not necessarily is to say that we are just collecting the signals and, and that's it, right? We will do, uh, once we collected all of these signals, it will go, go through an extensive process of filtering based on criteria. We will do focal group discussions so in, in order to flesh out the, the most important themes and the most important weak signals and trends. We made sure that there, in the horizon scan process, there are six layers of quality assurance. Uh, first of all, we, we will conduct this foresight training and have regular supervision and uh, check-ins with, um, with the team. Uh, we do a systematic processing of signals. So again, what I explained already with the code book, with having uh, this, with building up this database, 
um, we will define and, and uh, criteria for the classification and ranking of the signals um, and we will validate the results with a wider focal group. Also, of course, the report will be peer reviewed and the source list and stakeholder mapping will be peer reviewed as well. Important steps, especially because in foresight, pe people are prone to having biases. They tend to look for the, for the things that they already know. The, 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 and here it's really key to look for the things you don't know yet and the things that uh, um, yeah, could maybe uh, challenge your your own assumptions already. So that's um, that's for how we are going to conduct the horizon scan. Uh, this is a, the, the Q and A slide, but I don't know if I would need to get it back, uh, give it back to Fita first. But please, if you have any questions, uh, just to throw them at us. We're happy to answer all of them. Yes, thank you, Mika. Thank you again, uh, Tina. I think this is very uh, useful because we have different uh, types of audience here. Those that are familiar with our uh, collaboration in MSME and Future and Foresight. Those who are familiar with the MSME work without uh, having more understanding on the project that we are doing currently. And those who have interest on new methodologies, not specifically on um, on the uh, MSMEs or in the future on sports side, but uh, these are from uh, BAPANAS, which, are, which is the planning agency. So they have also a different uh, kind of planning uh, that uh, uh, the audience have to then uh, conduct for uh, after this, hopefully. Um, okay, so I think what Tina has already mentioned is quite broad on what future and foresight. And then uh, and then we also learn new things about the new term here, like maybe for the other audience as well, about the horizon scanning and how horizon scanning can contribute to future and foresight. And I would also highlight the importance of um, having examples on how, or how this methodology is actually been used uh, in the government uh, or other organizations, uh, maybe can give a clear, um, better understanding on uh, the feasibility of using this new method uh, in government planning. Okay, um, I think we already have uh, some questions here, but uh, before I'm reading the questions, I would like to encourage all the participants, uh, I'll use um, Indonesian language, uh, for a bit. Uh, kepada Bapak Ibu, uh, silahkan bertanya melalui chat box atau melalui slido atau bisa langsung bertanya. Uh, memang uh, topiknya cukup luas dan tadi yang disampaikan ada yang dari uh, apa future and foresight itu sendiri sesuai dengan judul seminar, tapi kemudian kita juga masuk ke materi yang cukup lebih spesifik ya, yaitu horizon scanning yang ternyata adalah fondasi dari uh, future and foresight itu sendiri. Buat Bapak Ibu sekalian yang mungkin ingin bertanya di luar uh, tema MSMI, ataupun di dalam tema MSMI sendiri, uh, uh, jangan takut bertanya, karena mumpung di sini kita ada waktu dan ada kesempatan untuk berdiskusi langsung dengan uh, Tina dan dengan Mingke. Oke, okay, uh, so I will uh, ask one question uh, at first from the audience. Uh, I think this is very uh, interesting uh, question, uh, I must say. Uh, so it's uh, a bit more on the... Um, Resources, uh, Tina, uh, I think this is all, uh, for both of you. Um, what kind of resources do the government need to support the foresight project? Yeah, over to you, Tina, and then Minka. Thanks very much, Vita. Um, this is a very, very good question, and I think it's it would be difficult to give um, give one uh, exhaustive answer because it really depends um, depends also what purpose um, the horizon scanning or foresight uh, exercise is is uh, serving and how it's positioned in relation to the government decision making or or policy making and uh, and also if we look at the kind of um, different approaches to foresight they are always embedded in in the uh, tradition and, and need and culture so there's <laughs> there's no one one solution fits fits all and of course like some governments have a long uh, long standing tradition in in foresight and some are just uh, taking the first step so there's also different levels of uh, levels of maturity but what what i think is a good a good place to start is is to start um, start experimenting and um, 
and uh, developing different openings um, for foresight to to add value in uh, in uh, government processes, and um, and this is often something that requires a little bit trial and error. So you have a hypothesis that this is this is where foresight could could help us, and then then you try out the process, but. Um, I think the, the one of the common pitfalls is that you try to outsource <laughs> the foresight practice to somebody else, and, and then it's often left at the level of, of reports and, and kind of these products that are handed to decision makers, but then the challenge is, is that uh, there is no tradition and no capabilities to use the foresight um, uh, by the decision makers. So always the good place to start is to, to do capacity building, um, to understand what is futures and foresight and, and how, how we can use it in our specific context to solve our problems and, and then start uh, experimenting. And it's really important to have this um, understanding developing uh, internally and, and linked to kind of concrete use cases, that is the way to do foresight with an impact. <laughs> because of course you can have different foresight reports and all that, but then you need to have the capabilities, as Minke was saying, to ask this what if. So if this is going to happen, what does it mean for us? So um, I think in the future, the, the decision-making processes, because there's so much uncertainty, they have to be much more based on dialogue and, and, and this kind of speculation and sense-making, which is not just internally done, but uh, also includes many external stakeholders and, and bodies. And, and uh, this is exactly what, what we are trying to do here. We are trying to um, uh, kind of start this journey of learning and, and trying out different value propositions, uh, how foresight could help. So I would start with capability building, and, and then when you understand the use cases, which seem to be most relevant for you, then you can do the resourcing uh, and kind of seek external help <laughs> for, for your journey, external human resources. Um, and, and of course you have, can have like really big backend systems and data crunching systems to, to support this, but um, without understanding the use cases and having the kind of commitment at the senior levels as well to support side. The results are often very, very poor. So you can start with very little resources, which is which is maybe encouraging, but this cultural shift is something that needs to happen and often is a bit more difficult thing to do. <laughs> I hope that answers. Maybe Minka might have some something else to add, compliment. Just a compliment, because I think you're making excellent points of that it has to be a continuous process. It's not something as a one-off activity where you just produce a report or you just pick from from the from the foresight toolbox. You just do a bunch of scenarios or you just do a horizon scan. That's not that's not how you should or build up this uh, foresight capacity. So make it a continuous process. Uh, make sure it feeds into policy making and strategy making processes. Uh, have this buy-in from from uh, from senior management as well, and that's great that, that, that where you are you are involved and and, and willing to to uh, learn from this. Um, it requires not only this cultural change in, but really like a mindset change. You need to be able to embrace that uncertainty. You need to be able to embrace the, that you can't uh, you can't predict the future. This is you need to manage expectations here. Um, it's really trying to make sense and to, of the, the complexity uh, of, the, of the future. And that's uh, that's something that field foresight can help with. You need, like people tend to extrapolate the future, right? Uh, and, and foresight really provides you with, with the tools to, to not to look for different futures. How can the futures possibly play out? Uh, and that, that requires, different kind of thinking so there's really this mindset uh, shift is maybe even more important than building capacities or having resources uh, sorry having resources in place it's it's really about people who need to have a shift in uh, thinking 
Thank you, Tina and Minka. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree. I think the point of this capacity building and have some cultural changes on thinking, being open, iterative, and those are the uh, important thing to start answering uh, what kind of resources we need uh, for this uh, to conduct future and foresight methodology. And that will lead to uh, to the second question, uh, which I think is also interesting. Oh, I, I just wanted to highlight here that there are more than 12 questions already. Um, we'll try to catch up, but we also have limited time, but okay, so I'll ask the second question right away. Um, can you give us some concrete examples of a concrete action that a government has taken based on insights from horizon scanning or other foresight projects? Uh, over to you, Tina. Uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, you can go ahead if you have something. Sorry, too eager to answer. Too <laughs> eager to answer. Yeah, Minka, to you. Yeah, go. No, sorry. Um, uh, maybe in the in the context of my previous work in the, in the Netherlands, where we have this foresight capacity, uh, we uh, did this in the in in the context of national security. So we set up this horizon scan for national security, where we had uh, several teams looking for for potential new threats that could influence uh, uh, Dutch national security specifically. Uh, we made sure that this scan was done every year and that fed into agenda, was really meant as an agenda setting purpose. So for, for example, new things came up during that horizon scanning that were not being taken into account already in your national risk assessment, for example. So then it uh, it allows you to, to, to explore new things, exactly doing what, what this horizon scan should, should be doing. Uh, but you're not really sure yet about it, how it could play out. So then you build scenarios upon it, and you you try to flesh out how how different how yeah how, how it could potentially alter the future landscape and the future future threat landscape specifically. Um, and then in the end, it is up to policymakers to decide if, whether whether or not they should act upon this specific threat or this specific risk. But then it, it is at least on the radar. Uh, and this is how you, um, yeah, how it concretely can can influence uh, decision making, if that's helpful. But now over to Tina. Sorry. Thanks, Minke, and I, I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> so if uh, <laughs> so, we try to keep that. We I think we all are very excited and uh, ha happy to hear there's so many questions. If there's no time to address everything, we of course like happy to answer in writing. So. So we can then provide the responses after the session. But maybe, maybe to add that, I think there's a lot of activity to uh, to do the scanning to to identify the the future policy gaps. Like for instance, in the UN context, we have a project looking at the uh, neuroscience and neurotechnology. So so what are the new threats emerging when these biological and and technological systems are more deeply integrated, and what the consequences? Uh, could be what what the world could look like. What are the new emerging threats? So we can, for instance, do the the storytelling around those to to make these future risks more tangible, and this can then then um, then feed into into the policy policy making um, uh, fora. Um, but maybe maybe also like um, this is from the government of Finland. They they are for, for instance doing the budgeting uh, based on scenario exercises already so it doesn't just have to be around around the planning and strategy but but of course the end objective is really to um to integrate these anticipatory approaches at all levels uh, uh covering the key key processes for for implementation and i think budgeting is really really great because we are often used to that we do that based on um, very clear facts and, and plans, but uh, it looks very different when you do budgeting based on high high uncertainty and, uh, and kind of create alternatives around alternative scenarios that where the um, government investment should be should the different scenarios play play out. So I really like that example as well because it's it's very very concrete. Thank you for the examples, uh, Tina and Minka. I think there is also one more question that can uh, maybe still uh, lead to that, is that how would you then uh, measure impact for uh, using this methodology? Well, this is a wonderful question. <laughs> and, uh, and this is something that we've been also thinking about a lot because uh, we are in the process of reviewing our um, our um, uh, impact frameworks and, and ME 
M&A frameworks as well. Uh, so, um, and, and this is also a question of how do we, what, do, what are the different timeframes for measuring and evaluating impact as well? Of course, like you can evaluate like um, how, at the implementation level, how, how your, um, your uh, programs are progressing. But uh, we are also trying to trying to incorporate new like forward looking uh, indicators in our our frameworks, and this, for instance, uh, includes the implications um, for future generations. So, um, what what are the uh, projected implications of our um, policies, for instance, today? If we implement them, what the world would look like, and and how it would impact the situation for specific groups, for instance, in the future. So, um, so it's it's also a little bit speculative. And I think evaluating the implications also um, requires doing foresight because you have to project uh, from today, like what are the implications longer term and, and what, um, what the results could look like for a specific group. And, and then how through the, the policy you start actively uh, mitigating those, those things as well. So um, I think one of, one of the key objectives we have here is that we try to build monitoring and evaluation and kind of impact measuring framework, which are also forward looking and reinforce that accountability um, across the longer uh, timeframes. But beyond looking at that impact, we also uh, try to measure learning, uh, try to measure things that, how do we move to value creation not just doing things internally, but together with a broader network of value creators, including academia or then communities. Uh, we have indicators around inclusion and, and diversity as well, because um, um, just like innovation practices as well, futures and foresight have been uh, have been a practice of really small group of people, mainly in the Western, Western countries and, and in big corporations. Um, so this is also something, something we need to move towards. So we have to be really mindful that we diversify our inputs <laughs> and, uh, and do that as a priority of our practice to move towards more inclusive and equitable futures as well. So I think that's also one, one of the important indicators for our work. But Minke, maybe you have some, <laughs> some points you wanted to add. It's, yeah, it's obviously the, the question everybody has, like, how, what is the actual I impact of it? And again, this this goes back to the, it's this it's a skill you are yeah. developing. Uh, and it's it's really trying to better understand the future and about uh, generating options, basically. So yeah, it's, uh, it's hard to measure indirect impact, but it's, it's, uh, it's a common practice in in a lot of countries to really enhance your your understanding of what could potentially alter this this landscape and how can we make policies and strategies more robust because we it is uh, like decisions that have been pre-tested against alternative futures are really likely to to stand the test of time more more likely than than uh, uh, and 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 you have more robust and resilient strategies in the end. So it's about building resilience, uh, and that's that's of course hard to measure. But it's that's that should not be the reason not to do it because it's we've seen in the future or in in the past actually not in the future but hopefully also in the future that uh, the countries and, and organizations that do uh, engage in the, in the art of strategic foresight or in the practice of strategic foresight, that, it's, uh, that, they, that they are more robust in, in the way that, uh, to, to, and, uh, yeah, to tackle crisis. So yes, focus on impact, but also be aware that this is about building resilience and which is, uh, which is yeah, harder to measure. Yes, thank you. It's it's always the questions uh, 
right? But uh, I guess it's also important point to highlight that uh, it is uh, on the, we are building uh, on the framework to measure the impact, but that's not the reason to not do it just because there is no certain answer on, on, on that question. Um, going back again, that we have to be open and um, uh, iterative and build resilience for, for the uh, future. I think that's the key message uh, on this discussion. So I will ask uh, two more questions, but um, since we already have have around 15, more than 15 questions, which is good. And I'm very uh, happy that uh, people are very engaged and with high engagement, I think, here at Tina Mika. So we will compile uh, all the, these questions and then uh, we, we can then uh, share it with the audience maybe next week. Um, and we will compile the uh, answers from you as well. Um, if that works. But before that, I, I think I will uh, ask two more questions here. Uh, the first is, um, so how often should we do the foresight analysis? Uh, I'm, I'm picking these questions because then this is also there, uh, um, related to uh, government planning, right? So how often should we do the foresight analysis? If we do the foresight in 2024 to 2045, for example, uh, should we do another foresight analysis as an update for next year or maybe in two years or in three years. So I will uh, either Tina or Minka, anyone want to take, take this yeah. question? Yeah. You can, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, th I think it goes back to a point we made earlier. It's it's how often it's it's a process. It's a continuous process, uh, especially horizon scanning is something, it's not something that you do for a limited amount of time and then just, just, just stop it. You just develop the skill of doing the horizon scanning and ideally, an horizon scan you would do a period, period, allergy, sorry, there's, a, there's several periods, uh, and that con that feeds into, for example, the development of scenarios uh, that you do on a yearly basis, or, and that way you, um, it's yeah, you ensure it's not just a standalone process, a standalone activity, but it's really. Uh, yeah, you, you keep on updating it, it and, and that's, yeah, I think key to understand. It's not something you just do and then you check a box. It's continuous effort to, to be able to understand what, what uh, influences the future. Yeah, and I, I think also he, here we have to remember that our planning processes are, are developed uh, in the times of steady, slow development and, and kind of this linear progress. So they are not really aligned with the high uncertainty and, and, and kind of high, high risk, high unpredictability that we are surrounded by now. So this is also one of the key questions that we have that how do we need to change the, the decision making and planning processes to, to make sure that um, they are aligned with the realities of the current world. And, and this is also something in, in the UN context that we are we are actively working, we are reviewing the planning processes and, and also what kind of data is used as an input for those decision and, and planning processes and how can we incorporate that um, future looking, forward looking element. Um, and, and this, let's say, speculative inquiry, so you don't plan based on what you know or what you learned from the past, but what do you anticipate or want to happen in the future? So it's really, changing uh changing the perspective in the, in the planning processes as well and this is of course very very new <laughs> but we are actively working working towards also changing the decision making and planning processes and and um, when you have a kind of main cycle of process how could you do the revision more dynamically based on based on this ongoing um ongoing foresight and, and ongoing data data collection um to to make that more robust and as Minka said more resilient as well okay thank you Tina um and thank you Minka for the answer uh I think one more question that may be a little bit uh technical and touch upon uh your presentation Minka is that about the signals uh, signals that finding a weak signal is quite difficult and could you share your experience when you're doing the horizon scanning and finding weak signals? 
Uh, it is difficult uh, in in a sense because it's it's a weak signal, right? If it would have been a strong signal, it would already been on the on the radar of policymakers. So, uh, and also the difficulty is that it's in a sense it's uh, it's what is new to to me is not necessarily new or a weak signal to you. So it's it's a, it's a relatively a bit of a subjective uh, interpretation of the of the signal you found. But what what does help if if you it's probably in the beginning of, of starting the, to do this arise scanning and to do the scanning it is difficult and you won't recognize immediately what is an immediate what is a weak signal because you first need a bit of better understanding of the of the environment of the the the, the, the trends that that uh, are, are emerging and then you you will get better in it in in uh, in recognizing what is what is a weak signal um so it's it's indeed not a not an easy task um yeah there we will up touch upon in the training on on uh what could potentially be weak signals and what is a strong signal so that's maybe not something that, you, that what is a wrong weak signal uh so no no worries too much there uh, i think we shared to 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 signals that that could be uh something that that it should be on the radar it's often something where you first might think like, no, no, this is this is probably not going to happen. And if that happens, uh, then you should think a bit bit further. And then it, that that's where it gets interesting. Or when it fringes with your own uh, assumptions, then then it's probably something you need to dig deeper a bit, because um, then that's probably where the change is emerging. So. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's something that we will touch upon in the training as well, uh, and uh, uh, it's it demands training and it demands a bit of uh, discipline as well to actually do the scanning. All right, so we have to embrace subjectivity also, right? <laughs> to answer this. Yeah, um, in, a, in a way. Yeah. In a way. In a way. In a way. I don't want to say that it's a, <laughs> a subject. Like it, it, the process itself is designed to to limit our biases and to filter out the quality, mm -hmm. high quality uh, signals, right? By and this is a peer review process, so not too much to worry. But this, the the scanning itself is a bit of a subjective matter, indeed. Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the discussion. Um, this is very interesting. And uh, I think, as I mentioned, we will uh, compile the questions and then send it over to you. And then if uh, uh, we can, uh, then we, we will share it next week to the audience because they've already filled out their um, information, uh, their email addresses in the uh, participant list, and we'll share it uh, with them uh, next week. Would that work for you, Tina and Minka? For sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Shoot, uh, shoot, and uh, fire away with your questions. We're happy to answer. <laughs> okay, so that sounds um, great. Yeah, so thank, thank you for all the questions and, and and the conversation. That was very very interesting. Much appreciated. Yes, um, in it. Okay, I will switch to uh, Indonesian uh, again uh, for the session. Uh, baik, terima kasih Bapak Ibu atas partisipasinya dan atas pertanyaan-pertanyaannya yang sangat menarik uh, sehingga membuat diskusinya uh, sebenarnya kurang ya, tetapi memang uh, kita mendesain seminar yang kali ini sebagai pengenalan atau introduction. Jadi mungkin kita tidak akan bisa membahas terlalu detail, tetapi uh, sedikit uh, memiliki gambaran tentang metode feature and photo site dan tadi juga disampaikan sedikit gambaran tentang uh, bagaimana uh, melakukan feature and foresight dan uh, horizon scanning sebagai fondasi utamanya. Uh, untuk pertanyaan-pertanyaan um, nanti uh, jangan khawatir yang belum sempat ditanyakan akan kami uh, compile pertanyaannya dan akan kami uh, jawab dulu dan kami akan kirimkan ke uh, email Bapak Ibu sekalian atau kontak Bapak Ibu sekalian yang telah mengisi di uh, form uh, apa pen, uh, daftar hadir tadi. Baik, um, sebelum kita tutup acara pada uh, sore hari ini, uh, saya akan uh, mengundang uh, Messi Angelina uh, selaku social system lead dari Puslab Jakarta untuk menutup acara ini uh, dan juga menyampaikan beberapa poin yang uh, mungkin bisa bermanfaat untuk Bapak Ibu sekalian ketahui untuk uh, kedepannya dan mungkin beberapa poin-poin uh, penting. Uh, kepada Messi, saya persilahkan. Terima kasih banyak Vita dan terima kasih juga Bapak dan Ibu sekalian untuk diskusi yang sangat hangat dan meriah pada hari ini. 
Jadi perkenalkan, nama saya Maisy Angelina dari Falsler Jakarta. Dan sebelum kita menutup acara hari ini, perkenankan saya untuk menyampaikan rangkuman singkat dari diskusi kita satu setengah jam terakhir. Yang pertama, strategic foresight adalah pendekatan untuk melakukan perencanaan dan juga penyusunan strategi jangka panjang. Pendekatan ini muncul berdasarkan pemahaman bahwa masa depan bukan kepastian yang dapat diprediksi, melainkan berbagai kemungkinan skenario yang dapat dibentuk oleh strategi dan tindakan yang kita lakukan hari ini. Mungkin kedengarannya ini agak ambigu, tapi sebetulnya strategic foresight adalah pendekatan ilmiah yang sangat terstruktur. Tadi Bapak dan Ibu sekalian mendapatkan gambaran dari penjelasan Mingke tentang bagaimana salah satu saja metode dari strategic foresight, yaitu horizon scanning, mempunyai langkah-langkah dan juga sistem quality assurance untuk memastikan bahwa pemahaman yang kita bangun untuk membuat perkiraan mengenai skenario di masa depan beserta faktor-faktor yang mendorong atau menghambatnya mempunyai fondasi yang cukup kuat. Pemahaman ini akan memungkinkan kita untuk bergeser dari kerja reaktif berdasarkan prioritas mendesak dan pertimbangan jangka pendek menuju kerja proaktif untuk membangun visi dan bekerja menuju skenario pembangunan yang lebih inklusif dan berkelanjutan. Kedua, poin penting yang ingin saya tekankan juga adalah bahwa Strategic foresight ini bukan metode yang sepenuhnya baru, karena pemerintah, organisasi internasional, masyarakat sipil, serta pihak swasta di berbagai negara di dunia sudah menggunakan strategic foresight sebagai bagian dari perencanaan strategis mereka. Hari ini kita sudah mendengar beberapa contoh tentang penggunaan strategic foresight dari Minke dan Tina. Selain dari pemerintah Finlandia, yang menyusun laporan berkala tentang skenario masa depan secara partisipatif dengan perwakilan akademia, masyarakat sipil, dan juga perwakilan kelompok marginal, kita juga punya beberapa contoh dari negara-negara yang lebih dekat dan bertetangga dengan kita. Misalnya, pemerintah Dubai, secara berkala mereka menyelenggarakan acara bernama Museum of the Future, di mana mereka menyuguhkan beberapa berbagai artefak untuk menggugah pemikiran dari orang-orang yang datang tentang berbagai skenario atau faktor yang mungkin bisa membentuk masa depan. Lebih dekat lagi di Singapura, pemerintah Singapura telah memberikan mandat kepada semua kementeriannya untuk menyusun laporan strategic foresight sebagai bahan penyusunan program kerja tahunan. Dan bahkan di Indonesia sendiri, Badan Pemeriksa Keuangan Indonesia telah mendirikan Center for Foresight pada tahun 2021 untuk memfasilitasi pembuatan kebijakan di tengah-tengah situasi ketidakpastian yang tinggi di masa pandemi. Nah, Bapak Nas pun menyadari pentingnya strategic foresight untuk perencanaan jangka panjang. Direktorat Pengembangan UKM dan Koperasi, serta Pusdatin Renbang Bapak Nas, bersama kami di Yuan Global Pulse Jakarta dan Finlandia, meluncurkan inisiatif bersama untuk melakukan horizon scanning tentang faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi masa depan dari usaha mikro, kecil, dan menengah di Indonesia. Kita semua yang hadir di sini peduli dengan UMKM. Kita semua tahu bahwa UMKM adalah tulang punggung dari ekonomi Indonesia. Saat ini, ada lebih dari 64 juta UMKM yang memberikan pekerjaan bagi lebih dari 90 persen total pekerja di Indonesia. UMKM juga memberikan kontribusi untuk lebih dari 60 persen pendapatan Indonesia di tahun 2019. Sektor ini mengalami guncangan ketika pandemi dimulai tahun 2020 dan juga menjadi salah satu prioritas pemerintah Indonesia dalam program pemulihan ekonomi nasional. Pertanyaan kita bersama adalah, seperti apa skenario-skenario masa depan sektor UMKM di Indonesia dalam 5-20 tahun mendatang? Apa saja faktor penentu yang dapat mempengaruhi sektor UMKM di Indonesia? Dan juga bagaimana kita bisa mengidentifikasi faktor-faktor tersebut saat ini dan cukup yakin dengan faktor-faktor itu? Nah, Bapak Nas dan Yuan Global Pulse akan menerapkan horizon scanning sebagai fondasi dari metode strategic foresight untuk menjawab pertanyaan-pertanyaan tersebut. Tadi Bapak dan Ibu sekalian sudah mendengar tentang kira-kira prosesnya seperti apa. Jadi selama beberapa bulan ke depan, tim yang terdiri dari Global Pulse Jakarta dan juga Bapak Penas akan bersama-sama melakukan proses untuk melakukan scanning literatur, wawancara dengan narasumber kunci, serta validasi sinyal bersama dengan panel ahli untuk menelusuri secara terstruktur faktor-faktor yang mempengaruhi tantangan dan peluang dalam sektor UMKM Indonesia di masa mendatang. Hasilnya ada beberapa. Yang pertama, kami berharap laporan interaktif yang ada juga dalam sebuah microsite bisa diakses teman-teman semua dan juga publik yang lebih luas di akhir tahun 2022. Kami harapkan laporan ini dapat memberikan masukan untuk perencanaan strategis 
sehingga ekosistem UMKM di Indonesia dapat didukung menuju ekonomi yang lebih inklusif dan berkelanjutan. Tapi yang kedua, seperti yang disampaikan oleh Minka dan Tina tadi, um, strategic foresight, raisin scanning, ini sebetulnya adalah sebuah skill, sebuah kemampuan yang perlu terus untuk diasah dan dikembangkan. Jadi, kami walaupun akan ada produk di akhir tahun ini, kami juga berharap yang akan berkembang dari sini adalah keingin tahuan tentang bagaimana metode ini bisa diterapkan dalam berbagai cara, bagaimana kita bisa melakukannya dengan sistematis dan terstruktur, dan bagaimana kita bisa membagikan pembelajaran bersama ini kepada para pemerintah, anggota pemerintah lain di Indonesia, akademia maupun masyarakat sipil. Oleh karena itu, kami juga akan melakukan serangkaian acara di akhir tahun ini untuk lebih menebarkan pembelajaran mengenai bagaimana kita melakukan strategic foresight secara terstruktur di Indonesia. Kami harap pada saat tersebut, Bapak dan Ibu sekalian tetap untuk menjadi bersemangat dan tertarik untuk berproses dan belajar bersama dengan kami di Global Plus Jakarta dan juga di Bapenas. Demikian pesan dari saya, terima kasih banyak. Baik, terima kasih, Nisi. Uh, baik dengan ini, Bapak-Ibu sekalian, acara kami tutup. Uh, mohon izin Pak Dading, Pak Irfan, dan Pak Petra untuk menutup acara pada sore hari ini. Uh, dan sekali lagi terima kasih kepada Tina dan Mingke sebagai narasumber dan tentunya kepada Bapak-Ibu sekalian yang telah hadir dan memberikan pertanyaan-pertanyaan yang sangat menarik sehingga diskusi kita terasa kurang. Uh, itu adalah indikasi yang baik ya <laughs> kalau kita merasa waktunya kurang. Oke, okay, nah untuk menutup acara sore hari ini, sekali lagi sebelum kita bubar, kami minta waktu untuk foto bersama. Jadi uh, kami harap Bapak-Ibu sekalian berkenan untuk membuka videonya. Uh, untuk yang berkenan membuka videonya kami persilahkan dan kami akan um, melakukan uh, foto bersama. Uh, Swastika sudah siap untuk mengambil foto? Uh, ada yang belum uh, menunggu membuka. Okay, baik, mungkin untuk yang belum membuka kameranya, uh, apa -apa ya, belum. kalau yang untuk, okay, mungkin dari Divet ada yang uh, berkenan untuk membuka kameranya? Mbak Luisa atau yang lain untuk dapat foto bersama? Oke, okay. baik mungkin kita mulai saja ya, uh, Swastika. Oke, okay, uh, Q-nya dari saya. Di... Ya. Ya. Oke, okay, satu, dua, tiga. Ini untuk halaman pertama, sebentar ya. Uh, Oke, okay. untuk halaman kedua, satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay. sudah. Terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih, Swastika. Baik, sekali lagi terima kasih Bapak-Ibu sekalian. Sampai jumpa di acara berikutnya. Dan mohon maaf waktunya agak molor. Mudah-mudahan seminar kali ini bisa bermanfaat. Dan apabila ingin berdiskusi lebih lanjut, silakan hubungi kami ataupun rekan-rekan di Bapenas. Terima kasih, selamat sore. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Pak Dading. Terima kasih. Terima kasih semuanya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih semua. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Terima kasih Mbak Mariska. Ih, Mbak Caca, terima kasih Mbak Caca. Mbak Mariska, terima kasih. Thank you Mbak Caca. Terima kasih Mbak Caca. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Fine, thank you so much. Thanks, Mario. Thank you. Minka, Tina.